Welcome back ladies and gents to another Rock the JVM video. I'm Daniel and in this video I'm going to teach you five nice Scala tricks that you can use to write more concise and expressive code. Now this video is for Scala programmers of all levels because the techniques that I'm going to teach you in this video are less known so uh, the goal of this video is to trigger at least once the reaction that looks like okay wow this is pretty cool I didn't know that I'm gonna use it in my code so as always I will recommend that you code alongside me and whenever you need to write more concise code and need some nifty techniques just refer back to this video obviously this video is also available in written form at rockthegvm.com forward slash blog much like other videos and you will find the link to the article in the description attached to this video. All right, now let me go back to my development environment and let me show you some tricks that Scala has up its sleeve. The trick number one is the single abstract method pattern. You may have used it before, but just in case you don't, here is the general pattern. So since Scala 2.12, abstract classes or traits with a single unimplemented method, that is an abstract method, can be reduced to plain lambdas. And uh, here's an example. If I define a trait, let's call this action, and uh, if you define a small method called act, for example, that takes some arguments, let's say it takes an int and returns another int, I'm gonna leave it abstract and you can define an instance of an action like this, for example, let's call this my action of type action. And on the right hand side, you can pass a lambda. So you can say x int arrow x plus one. So this actually compiles because the lambda can be attributed to the implementation of the single method that's unimplemented in the trait action. So in this case, the compiler can automatically convert from the lambda type, which is a function int arrow int, into an anonymous instance of action. So uh, behind the scenes, the compiler does something like this, val my action of type action is a new action, where the on the spot implementation of def act of x int is x plus 1. Now, this technique also works if the trait action or the abstract class that you want to instantiate also has some implemented methods. For example, if you have, for example, an implemented method which takes no arguments and uh, returns 43 or something like that, notice that this code still compiles. This trick is particularly useful for spawning JVM threats. So uh, in real life, this abstract method pattern is used quite often to spin up JVM threads because they traditionally take a runnable as argument, which is an interface with a single abstract method. So traditionally in Java and uh, in Scala prior to 2.12, you would say new thread with new runnable, where you will need to implement this def run abstract method. However, in Scala 2.12 and after, you can actually spawn a new thread by passing a zero lambda. So you can say print line, I don't know, I'm running easy. And then you can, of course, start it or do whatever you want. So notice that in this particular case, we are writing more concise code by passing a single lambda, which is much more attributable to functional programming. So this is pretty elegant. All right, so that was trick number one. Let me show you trick Number two, with right associative methods. Now, if you've ever wondered how you could write expressions like, let's call this prepended element, to be something like two colon colon and then a list of some other elements. So you're probably aware that the colon colon method is used in fix. So this is an infix method, but it's supposed to be a member of the list type but not on the int type. So how does this work? Now, the answer is baked right into the Scala syntax because methods with non-alphanumeric names, like colon colon, that end in a colon, like this one, are right associative. By this we mean that we can write expressions like one colon colon two colon colon three colon colon some list, and this is fine for the compiler because in fact it means the equivalent of one colon colon and then a parenthesis, two colon colon parenthesis, three colon colon list. All right, so it's right associative in the sense that the rightmost operator executes first. Now the way that the compiler actually achieves that is that it rewrites as list dot colon colon three. 
So I'm applying the colon colon method on the list object with the argument three, and the following list applies the colon colon method on the argument two, which then applies the colon colon method on the argument one. So this is how the compiler rewrites the above code. Now this is applicable to any methods that end in a colon whose names are formed out of non-alphanumeric characters. So can you write your own operator like that? Of course you can. Here's an example. I'm going to define a class, let's call this message Q. And uh, just for the sake of expressiveness, I'm gonna make it generic. And I'm going to define an NQ method that looks very expressive like an arrow. So I'm gonna define a method like that looks like this, dash dash greater than and then a colon and uh, this will receive a value of type t and this will return another message q of t and uh, i'm going to uh, leave this method with no implementation or simply return a new message q of t i don't really care about the implementation i only care about the form of the method and the way that you're going to use it after that so i'm going to define a value called q and I could write a very similar thing to what we wrote earlier with list. So I'm gonna, I can say three arrow colon two arrow colon one and then arrow colon new message queue of int. And this is perfectly fine. So uh, you can make an operator uh, end in a column and uh, make it have a name with non-alphanumeric characters, like an arrow with a column, but you can be as creative as you like. And this operator will run in the same style as we wrote earlier with list. So the compiler will actually rewrite your code as new message Q int dot arrow column with the argument one, dot arrow column with the argument two, and then dot arrow column with the argument three. So this is a pretty nifty tool that allows you to write more elegant data structures that look like math. Okay, cool. So that was trick number two. Let me teach you trick number three with baked in setters. Now, uh, if you come from Java, the getter and setter pattern is very familiar. It's almost uh, ingrained into the Java code style. Now, in, in Scala, we discourage mutable data structures in general, the settable parts of data structures. But in case we do need mutable data structures, we don't want the fields exposed as, as vars. Now, at the same time, the old getter and setter pattern is just too verbose and detracts from code elegance. So Scala has this getter and setter baked in functionality that looks something like this. Let me create a class. Let's call this mutable int wrapper, which is just a mutable data structure that wraps a private var, let's call this internal value, uh, which I'm going to start as zero. Now the getter can be any method you like. So for example, I can define a method called value with no arguments. So this will be a quote unquote accessor method. And I'm simply going to return internal value inside. And for the setter, you can write something like this. You can define a method that's named value underscore equals that will take a single argument i'm going to name this new value of type int and this returns unit and the implementation of that is going to be that you are you want to change your internal value to whatever you receive as argument so i'm going to say internal value equals new value so this is a setter method in the sense that you are uh, setting your internal state with whatever you receive as argument now when you write something like this, and when you define two methods, getter and setter, with this exact shape, the name underscore equals with a single argument that returns a unit, you can now write a much more natural setter statement. So you can define a, let's call this a wrapper, as new mutable int wrapper, and you can then say wrapper dot value equals 43, for example. So when you say wrapper.value equals 43, the compiler rewrites that as wrapper.value underscore equals with the argument 43. 
So notice we have a much more natural setter like statement here as if we had exposed the member called value to have the value 43. But the logic inside of the getter can be whatever you want. You can actually make this synchronized to uh, isolate for multi thread access and so on and so forth. So the getter logic and the setter logic can be whatever you want. Obviously, you can also access the value getter by uh, printing for example, wrapper.value, which is simply calling the value method from this wrapper instance. Okay, so notice we have this very natural getter and setter structure. So that was trick number three. Let me teach you another one. Trick number four with multi word members. So most of the time Scala allows us to define symbol names like type names, method names, field names, and so on and so forth with a single word. But Scala has this capability of defining multi word members. So um, let me define a class called person with a name as a string. I'm actually going to define it as a case class, just to be able to instantiate that without new. And I can define a method that looks something like this. So look closely, I'm going to define a method that starts with backtick. And then I'm going to define the method as then said. And then I'm going to put backticks. So notice that when you wrap this piece of text in between backticks, it's treated as a single symbol. So this is a valid member name, this is a valid method name. And uh, I can pass any arguments as, as we like, as we defined a normal method. So I can say that the thing is a string. And uh, I can return name said, name then said, and then I can pass in the thing. Okay, now if I define a uh, person instance like Jim as a new person with the name Jim, if you're named Jim, then you're uh, the lucky one to be called this method on. So you can say Jim and then backtick then said. And then you can pass in some argument. Scala is pretty awesome. So you can use this method name then said with written in multiple words as you would on any other object and on any other method. And if the, the method has a single argument, you can infix that as I did over here. Now a real life example where this kind of naming is actually used successfully is Akka HTTP. so that it can keep the familiar HTTP terms exactly as they are. Um, some things that I use in my real blog uh, generation tool to do syntax highlighting, I use, for example, content types from Akka HTTP, and uh, I use that from the Scala DSL uh, model. And notice that content types has th these fields with backticks. So you have, for example, text, dash text slash HTML. That is because the slash would normally not be allowed in a uh, identifier in a symbol identifier. So it's used in backticks so that you can use the familiar HTTP terms. All right, so that was trick number four trick number five. And the final for this video is still going to use backticks. But I'm going to use backticks for pattern matching. So um, this is a very small but powerful feature of pattern matching, the ability to match an existing variable exactly. So assume you have a value that you deduce from a method call that I'm going to call meaning of life. And assume you've put in a lot of work to figure out what this value is going to be. I'm going to return 42 because it's very easy. And you want to match a uh, value against this meaning of life variable. So I'm going to define some uh, data field of type any, and I'm going to make it have a value 45. And assume you want to do pattern matching against the meaning of life. The way that you would normally do that would be to say, let's call this PM as data match. And if you wrote something like case meaning of life, 
This is actually wrong because the meaning of life that you're using here is just a value name that is being matched against the data. So this meaning of life is just shadowing the actual field that you want to match against. And IntelliJ is usually pretty smart and it will warn you suspicious shadowing by a variable pattern. So this will not match your meaning of life 42, but it will match anything and it will give that anything the name meaning of life so that you can use it here. So this is pretty wrong. The right way, but uh, the most common way, and uh, probably not as uh, elegant, is to say, let's call this PM2 as data match, and you would match anything, like X, if X equals meaning of life. And then you would use X here, or you would use meaning of life, or you would use whatever else you need to uh, run your piece of logic when your data matches meaning of life. But the very elegant way to match against the meaning of life in the cases of your pattern match would be to say, let's call this PM3 as data match. And in my case, I'm going to say case and I'm going to use backticks and inside I'm going to pass in meaning of life. Let me put it in the backtick. So when you write a backtick like this, you essentially do what PM2 wanted to do, but you're matching meaning of life exactly without this awkward structure over here. So you would continue your logic. So these backticks are basically a shorthand for saying match the exact value this variable has right now. So Scala has some powerful and expressive features that allow you to write more elegant and concise code. So my bet is that even if you're an advanced Scala programmer, there is at least one, th uh, one trick in this video that you did not know about. So I hope these will all be useful. And in the meantime, I'm waiting for you in the next videos. In the meantime, if you like this video, go ahead and click the like button for me and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this to be coming soon. You'll find the links to everything that we discussed in the description attached to this video. And if you want to learn learn more about the upcoming material from Rock the GVM, go ahead and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. In the meantime, thank you for watching.